Welcome to Talking It Out. I'm Jonathan Geffner, and my special guest today is Andy Gross. He is a very popular, multi-talented entertainer, stand-up comic, magician, and ventriloquist. And you've probably seen him on numerous TV appearances, maybe in comedy clubs, maybe in Las Vegas or in cruise ships, corporations, colleges, theaters, all kinds of places. He's got some viral videos that he's produced in recent uh, times also. So it's my pleasure to welcome you, Andy, to Talking Out. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And nice to see you again, by the way. Andy and I know, well, we knew each other. We kind of know each other from a long time ago, from Vent, Vent conventions, at ventriloquist conventions, we call Vent, Vent conventions. Yeah, many, many years ago already. It's crazy how time is flying, but uh, we're in the 90s. Yeah, well, nice to see you finally again, face-to-face -face yeah. virtually. These days, you seem to be particularly known for your unique kind of prank videos. I guess we can call them prank videos, right? They're sure. in, in that genre, yeah. right? Two popular ones that I've seen are Split Man and mm -hmm. then also Take the Head Off thing, the Head yeah. Off, whatever yeah. you call that. Right. They've gone viral, as I mentioned, on, on social media. And how did that develop? How did you come about doing that? Where did you get the idea and when did that start? Sure. It was, um, it was a bit that I was doing in my act. It's kind of an interesting story, really. I was doing this bit where it looked like I was cut in half. And, it, you know, the oldest trick in the world, really, for magicians is cutting someone in half. But, you know, we just did it without those big boxes. And I was doing it in my act. And I thought, gosh, this would be really fun just to take it out in the streets and just have some fun with it and see what happens. And we had just moved into a new neighborhood, brand new. I mean, we were there maybe a month. And I told my daughter, who was 13 or 14 at the time, I said, get your iPhone. And I'm going to go down to the park and, and we're going to film this. And my wife, I remember saying, are you sure it's a good idea to go down to the park? and cut yourself in half and jump up from behind trees and scream and growl at people. And that's the best way to meet the new neighbors. Right. Said, and you said, that's fine. exactly the best way I could think of doing it. Right? I mean, can you imagine the neighbors, what they thought? They're, yeah, the new guy, just he's behind the trees, cut in half, growling yeah. at kids. There goes the neighborhood. Um, yeah, but it worked. <laughs> it worked. You know, we did most of it on an iPhone. And I'll tell you, to be honest, I put it up on YouTube. And this is before um, there were a lot of huge viral videos. I mean, I think, I think honestly, mine might have been one of the earliest viral videos of, especially magic stuff for sure and i had no idea i mean it was at 370 views right nothing mm -hmm. so i went to a show and i'll never forget three months after we did put it up my daughter calls me and she goes dad did you see the uh, video has seven thousand views and this is you know three months later i'm at dinner after mm -hmm. my show and I said, wow, that's great. You know, because normally it would take five years to get 7,000 views. Mm -hmm. She calls me back about 15 minutes later. She goes, it's at 25,000 views. And I was like, wow, what's going on? And all of a sudden my phone starts going bing, 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 bing. Because mm -hmm. I had set my phone up to have the comments and every, you know, mm -hmm. notifications yeah. coming in. So I had to turn those off because I'm at dinner and those things, it just wouldn't yeah. stop. And then it went to 250,000 that night, she told me. And then in the morning, in the morning, it was at a million and uh, and I don't really know how or why, to be honest with you. It's just somebody took it and shared it, and then that was Mysteries it. Mysteries of these algorithms. One, yeah. one never knows. You don't uh, know. You know. If, well, it, it touched something and funny. I know later something. on when I had a couple others, I, I followed it up and did some other things. I know that uh, some celebrities started sharing it. And one uh, in particular was a head pulling off one on the bus, uh, a Snoop Dogg. He shared it. He did. Oh, and well, that'll do Snoop it. Snoop Dogg yeah. shared it and tagged me. Then like Britney Spears put it up and Ashley uh, Kutcher put it up. And once they did it, it was like, come on. I mean, that was crazy. So which was the first one, the split man or the heads off? Uh, split man. I split man. I did it down in the park by the house. And oh. that's the one. Oh, that's that, the one you were talking about. Yeah, right? that's, the, the, that's the one that, yeah, you know, was, yeah. was really good. And then I followed it up on an elevator, which is kind of crazy because the guy that was filming for me. Yeah. I remember seeing that one. Stunt man. He's Mr. Tough Guy. And he said to me, he goes, he was funny. He goes, listen. Uh, I got your back outside. He goes, but if someone goes crazy on you in, a, in an elevator, there's nothing I can do because I'm outside here, you know? I can't <laughs> do anything. And I said, well, just keep rolling. It'd be a good good footage if they attack me. Yeah. <laughs> Even if it's your last video, it will go out with a bang <laughs> that way. So it's hard to describe. We Here we are describing it, but in case you haven't seen it or you forgot it or something, let's take a look at it. We have a, a clip here, some of the split man video, first of all. I 
girlfriend's no good because she left me standing and the man has no body. <laughs> oh, dude, <laughs> that's hilarious. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Ah! <laughs> yeah. Lechas y todo. Ah! Oh, ¿Qué pasó? ¿Qué pasó? ¿Qué pasó? ¿Qué pasó? ¿Qué Andy Gross, my guest here as Split Man. Most people are obviously freaked out their reactions. What, what's the most surprising? Is there, I, I mean, there's probably so many reactions, but is, is there one particular reaction that was the most surprising or unusual amongst all these people? Yeah, there's some really good ones. And people don't realize, you know, we might have to do this a lot more than you're seeing on the video because a lot of times people don't react so crazy. It's just so people yeah. that do react pretty sure. you know, over the top. Those are the ones we use. But there was one in, uh, that we did on a bus, and I ripped the girl's head off. And the bus driver, now this was down, I believe I was near Compton, actually. And the bus driver came at me with a bat. So he's coming at me with a bat. And so the people, the guys that were filming with me and everything came out and said, no, no, it's just me. He's a magician. He's doing this YouTube video. <laughs> and, and this is the kicker in Los Angeles. You know, everybody's an actor. So he says, the bus driver goes, oh, oh, that's great. You know, I'm I'm an, actually an actor. Let's do it again. I think I can do it better. Said, no, no, you don't. You don't get it. We got what we needed. Yeah. He, he wanted to do it again. Yeah. <laughs> We're taking you know 30 takes over here. I felt concerned about you. Each time I watched that, I always feel concerned. Like, what if someone attacks you? I mean, like, uh, uh, that's almost an attack that happened that time. It seems like it is. There's some danger in that, right? Because people could take it uh, seriously. There is. The there way. is. Right. And we try to be really careful with that, you know, that nobody really, really gets hurt and, you know, either, either me or people watching and, you know, so that is a concern. And we do, we do really, um, especially now that it's more popular than ever. I, I really am careful with that. I, well, I imagine you have some people in on it too, that to help think, get things going. Does that. Well, my people and there are, yeah, there, I have had some people like that that are with me, you know, to kind of start the stuff, you know, but then that's all, those are all real people. I mean, they just, you know, it's, it's it's crazy the reactions you do get. So the uh, you started with Split Man and then the heads off uh, was the next big prank that uh, that went viral. And that was uh, one on the bus people loved. Uh, yeah, and then how did that one develop? To were they both from your stage act? That one, the heads off thing, you, something you, you did. <clears throat> um, you know what? I wasn't doing that one in the act, but I do incorporate it now because it's you know so many people ask about it. I mean, it, the neat thing about doing these videos or how many people know, they don't know me always, but they always know the video. If, if you show that video before my shows, people will say, oh, oh yeah, this this guy, yeah, we've seen those videos. Let's go check him out. So that's great for ticket sales for sure. But I get people now screaming in the audience, and this is really cool too. Hey, hey, are you gonna, are you gonna rip my wife's head off? <laughs> and stuff like that. So I kind of almost have to do it. Not not rip his wife's head off, but <laughs> you know, if my assistant will come out, you know, and do something and I'll just grab her head and you know, we do a little bit of it just so they say they saw it. <laughs> mm. uh, well, we're talking about the heads off prank, so let's take a look at that. We have some clips from that too. Hey, hey! Oh, 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 Go. No, I'm 
Scared me to death. You don't just pull somebody's head off and run away. Almost peed my pants. <laughs> this dude came and he was yelling. It was crazy. It was crazy. You got me. Go. So Andy, your stage act, your uh, stage show has a lot of elements, the, the these magic and ventriloquism, and actually these these uh, pranks that we're talking about are, are magic tricks basically, right? So that's part, do you consider yourself or think of yourself mostly as a magician primarily? Or, I mean, I would, it seems to sort of, what do you think? Well, here's the, 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 that's a good question. And I knew it was coming. And my answer is ventriloquism for me is really my first love. And I love the mm. ventriloquism, maybe perhaps a little more than the magic in a way, maybe. Mm. But I don't do as much ventriloquism in the show as I do magic because it just kind of worked out that way. For some reason, the magic stuff started taking off more for me. So mm. I would say I'm probably 70 or 80% magic in the show and only, you know, 20 mm. or 30% of the ventriloquism. So, you know, but the, the main thing is I try to keep the comedy in there. My stuff is I try to make it as funny as possible. That's what I want. I want people to walk out of there and they say, oh, we didn't know it was going to be so much comedy. We thought it was mm -hmm. just going to be some, you know, magician, you know, doing some serious stuff. And it's not yeah. that, you know, yeah. it's well, on the lines of like, yeah, it's just a goofy, crazy stuff. Yeah. Well, I like that. And obviously lots of other people like it too. Uh, what, what's the word? Like you sort of like almost uh, parroting the genre, you know, right. that kind of thing, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I do a few little classic magic tricks that, you know, if you haven't seen them, it, they're funny and it works. And I still keep them in there, you know. Mm. So people really like those. But I do like to be able to to change up, you know, to go from a, the magic. Because after a while, you know, 30, 40 minutes of magic, you switch up, throw a little ventriloquism, and that really mm. keeps things moving along. I like that. So I do what, do that. What was your path toward these various aspects of entertaining? When, like, when did you start as a kid? And was it first magic or first ventriloquism? Uh, ventriloquism was first. I like probably so many others. The movie Magic. Mm, that's Anthony what inspired Hopkins. you, right? Uh, yeah, Anthony yeah. Hopkins. You too. Yeah, uh, well, it wasn't my first inspiration, no. But when I became a ventriloquist, then I got retroactively inspired by that. Yeah. Yeah, because that I, because was, I came I to it late. I was a young man when I got into it. Not as a kid. So, yeah, so, I saw it as a kid. My dad took me as a kid. My parents took me, and I, I couldn't have been more than I don't know eight, nine years old. And I just remember driving him crazy after the movie. How do they do that? How do they do that? And to this day, it still it ma it amazes me. He's passed away since. But my dad, I remember saying, you know, they substitute letters or something like that. <laughs> I used to and I think to myself, now, how did he know that? You know, back then, how would he know that? And it was kind of weird. But he would just finally say, go to the library, get some books. And then, of course, Paul <laughs> Winslow's book and Edgar Bergen's book and all the yeah. other ones. So is that how you learn from, from books? Primarily? I learned mainly from those books. And then I got hooked up. I called um, Dick Weston, came to town in St. Louis, where I lived. Again, mm. I was still young. Maybe couldn't have been more than 10. And my mom tracked him down somehow at the venue or the hotel he was at and got him on the phone for us. And I talked to him. I remember as a 10-year-old mm. talking to this guy. He was super nice and gave me Clinton Detweiler's name. 
from Mayor Studios. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember. And then I ordered the Mayor Chorus and my first dummy from them, of course. And uh, that's pretty much how I learned. How old were you when you first did a ventriloquist show? Probably 10. Wow. I remember, yeah. 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 And what was your, what were your parents' reactions or uh, family, other? Funny. We went, we went to um, a vacation. I think it was in Wisconsin somewhere. And they had this variety show that was mainly for the adults. And somehow my parents again talked to him and he's really good. You ought to let him come on stage. I was pretty good by then. I got pretty good. And they, you ought to let him come on. And they did. They said, well, we'll give him three minutes. We'll give him three minutes. And um, I went on there and they didn't stop me. I went about seven or eight minutes, I remember. And it was getting laughs and it was just so much. It was a lot of fun. It, it was great. And when did you add magic to the act, your young buddy <clears throat> I, act? Well, then I stopped. I mean, this was always a magic. Ventriloquism was a hobby. So the ventriloquism was first, of course. And then I had a friend that did magic. He showed me a few tricks and I was kind of hooked on that. Shortly after, I couldn't have been more than 10 or 11 again. Right away, I started learning some magic. And uh, but then I didn't perform, you know, for many, many years again after that one one performance um, because sports you had asked about. Remember, I was doing the racquetball stuff. Mm. So that was like the number one thing for me. And this magic of ventriloquism was a hobby forever. Yeah. So you were a very serious and successful racquetball player, right? So uh, That's right. what which years were you doing mm -hmm. that and uh, well, focusing I played, on it? It's interesting. I played early on and uh, I became I was the youngest professional player ever. I was 15 years old, so it was 1984, I guess it was, 80, 83 maybe even it was, and um, I qualified to play on the professional tour, and St. Louis, where I grew up, was like the mecca of racquetball. Why, I don't know, but mm. we had five right. of the top eight guys in the country playing out of St. Louis, you know, wow. and most of them came out of the JCCA, right there, they were all playing at the J, we called it, and... Um, JCCA stands for? Jewish Community Center. Oh, okay. So the Jewish they, Community Center Association, where they so were all, yeah. and that yeah. was like the top um, five of the top eight players in the country came right out of. Wow, who would have thunk it, huh? It, it was really, it, it was strange. Yeah, I mean, and so we just kind of grew up with these guys, and and it was great because racquetball at that time was one of the fastest growing sports in the country. It was almost like pickleball is today. You know, mm -hmm. everybody knows this pickleball now. It's like, what well, is pickleball? But it's a fun game too. But racquetball was huge. It was huge. All celebrities were playing, and it was. It seemed like it was going to be my, or should have been my, you know, life's profession. And mm -hmm. it was for about 10 years. I mean, it was fantastic. I toured the country and played these tournaments, had endorsements, was making money as a young guy. Mm -hmm. So I didn't go to school because, I mean, college I didn't go to because right. I was I was doing too well with this racquetball. Who needs like. college when you got that? Yeah. I mean, I was making a heck of a living and everything was great. Yeah. And then at about 25, it just died. I was mm -hmm. lucky. I mean, the sport just died and i was lucky mm. to get free shoes i was like now what am i gonna do you know i got what some money so any now idea? What do I do? yeah any idea why that is why the, the sport died yeah, i've got a pretty good idea it's um 90 i think this is and it's i think this is the main reason we were hitting the ball about 150 miles an hour so the television cameras couldn't pick it up uh. it's a terrible spectator sport on television <laughs> great spectator sport live i mean guys are diving all over the court and it's exciting as could be live but on TV, it just doesn't play well. You can't follow the ball. You don't know what's going on. Mm. And once the sponsors kind of found that out, <laughs> you couldn't play for millions of people. You could only play for a couple thousand watching the bleachers. Yeah. They kind of they started pulling out. And I think that's the biggest reason why it kind of died. Finally you know, dawned on them that, uh, hey, people can't see it, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, people were loving it. You know, there were, you know, 8 million people playing racquetball back then. It was a great sport. And just they couldn't build courts fast enough like they're doing with the pickleball. And then they couldn't knock them down fast enough or, or turn them into volleyball courts and, uh, you know, bicycle rooms now they are. I, I used to play at a club that had 30 courts, and all the courts now are like individual exercise rooms. You know, they got bikes in one room. They got a karate class. And these used to be old racquetball courts. So, uh, But, um, but I didn't know what to do. So I, I started doing um, – I was in California already for this racquetball. So I went and did some open mic nights. Went to the comedy store, the improv and all those. And they said, yeah, it's pretty good, you know, but – can you make it funnier? Because I was just doing magic and, and oh, stuff. And I said, make, yeah. you got to make it funnier, though. We're a comedy club. Yeah. And and then they said, come back. Can you do a middle act for us? And can you? So I started doing that. And I never looked back. Thank God, you know. So maybe a blessing in disguise. Or at the very yeah. least, it's uh, something good came out of uh, a big disappointment, I'm sure, when it died. <laughs> at first, it was oh, disappointing. Yeah, it was right? Because, I mean, you know, you since I was 
since you're seven years old, that's your whole, that's all you do every day, all day was work mm-hmm. out and, and, and play this racquetball. That, that was it. You know, it was like a, any right. other young athlete, gymnast or something that just does a 24 seven. That was our whole thing. That's all we Why did. I say blessing in disguise though, I'm thinking is because you wound up obviously with the successful career in this other completely other direction but also because at some point i don't know what at what age people age out because like you know sports are very limited you know, the oh, yeah. lifespan right? right so That's it's right. like i don't know how many uh, uh what's the oldest racquetball player who, who's still gonna yeah, be i mean on the you top hit, you know you hit that 40 and you're pretty much that's probably about it yeah you know, if that if that you know because right. it's pretty hard well, the racquetball's harder than knees harder than your back and um and it didn't make the kind of money the tennis players made or anything like that but but nevertheless it was good no, it was but you were good yeah, money in you did well because you were at the top of your profession right so right yeah we did okay well. but you know not not enough that you could walk away with a hundred million dollars or anything you know and say ah i'm not doing anything anymore <laughs> yeah well you gave me a something. good start gave me a good start it was great upbringing and uh, it's amazing to this day how many times i finish a show uh anywhere around the country and people come up to me older guys usually and they say hey i remember watching you play racquetball and i'm like wow you know pretty neat that people still remember that so i get a kick out of ever it. incorporated racquetball somehow into your act like a, a trick a magic trick involving racquetball or something since you're such an expert in it right it would be pretty neat you know <laughs> you know if I, I, it's a good idea i mean there is a trick that i i have it's I've always wondered about there's somebody markets and sells it. It's like uh, a disappearing ring that ends up inside of a racquetball. So oh, there you go. Looking, it's kind of interesting, but it might be kind of fun, you know, if I could still like just fire a shot across the stage right. or something, you know, and a card comes out. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, something to think about to <laughs> utilize the, your expertise because it's like just using a, a racket. Anybody could use a racket for a trick, but, you know, something where you could use a little bit of your skill if, would be great. If I could really hit it, you know, and they yeah. could see, wow, he just you know hit that ball pretty hard across the stage there. Yeah. So let's take a look at your stage show. We have a little promo for your stage okay. show so people yeah. get an idea of what that's like. Here it is. Andy Pay for the rental? Huh. You take Venmo? So that's Andy's stage show, a little glimpse of it anyway. Is there a major inspiration? Is there a person in particular who inspired you in any of these directions you've been? Well, racquetball, I'm sure there's a separate uh, inspiration. And uh, right. who was that? Just for some people who might know. There was a guy that was named uh, out of St. Louis. His name was Marty Hogan. And he was like the number one racquetball player for. 10 years straight. I mean, he dominated the sport, you know, even before I came, he was about 10 years older than me. And he was actually the first guy to walk away with millions of dollars from the sport. He really mm-hmm. did. He had his own racket lines and, you know, mm-hmm. and, and his name on the rackets in Kmart and Walmart and all those places. And uh, when it was very popular. So he was um, like kind of our mentor, I guess, in a way. And, and, and that helped a lot, but in, in ventriloquism, I didn't have one particular person really. I mean, I would just watch all the old time guys, you know, as much as I could. But even in the old days, as you know, you couldn't watch many people, right? And we couldn't see them like today. I mean, these yeah. kids get a chance to see so much online that it's yeah. crazy. Pre- I used internet. to just yeah. wait, you know, for soap yeah. so I could see Jay Johnson come on right. for his three lines and, you know, right. or watch him on, what was it, like Mike Douglas show and things like that. He mm-hmm. would be on every once in a while, which was pretty neat. And I loved him. I mean, he was still, still, you know, incredible. Um but just the old time guys watching any of those guys, Paul. Winkler. VHS. You probably got some VHS tapes when you could, right? That's what I did when I was getting. Into oh yeah, it. yeah. Uh-huh. I have all those old VHS tapes. I still got them. So I'm in a box over here somewhere sitting mm-hmm. here. Yeah, still got them. I want to convert them over one day because they're probably fun to watch. Mm-hmm. When you were uh, a kid, do you do you have a, a particular dream of what you wanted to do with your life? I mean, probably when you started playing racquetball, that that became the dream. Right? That was but, it. But what about right before? Or when did you start playing racquetball? I was only seven. seven oh, so, then, so that was so pretty was, much so your yeah. childhood dream. Well, we right? knew, but we knew then because, like I said, you know, like five of the other top eight guys were in the in St. Louis right there. And so when I was eight, nine, ten years old, and I see these guys, you know, getting brand new, uh, it used to be the 280ZX, the Datsun 280ZX. I don't know if you remember that car. It was like a cool car. And these guys would win these cars in a tournament. They'd show up with this 
cool sports car and you know they had it all going on i was like this is what i'm doing you know, this is it and um it seemed like we would and i did for 10 years but then like i said it died down but i but once i got into this ventriloquism even as a hobby i always in the back of my mind even though like my parents and people around me, yeah, it's just a phase. He's playing with dolls, whatever, you know. <laughs> <laughs> It'll go out. He's going to play racquetball and keep going. Yeah. You know, they, they, but they were very supportive. It wasn't like they didn't like it. You know, my dad uh -huh. would sit and read magic books with me and look at stuff. Oh, that's nice. Would, yeah, he, oh, yeah, he would sit there and watch about how to do the pass and the different moves. And, and right. uh, so they were both very supportive of, of it. But it just seemed like racquetball was the way I was going. And then yeah. it switched. So you're probably on the, on the road quite a bit, right? Traveling yeah. around? And yeah. what's, what's that like for you? Do you enjoy being on the road or is it more of a, a drag or uh, what's with the pros or the cons or both? I mean, I kind of, I love it. And I, it's funny because I loved it. Even when we were doing the sports, I was on the road a ton. Mm. And when I stopped, you know, we stopped for a while. It was like, oh my God, I got to get back on the road. This is, I can't just sit, you know. And um, so for me, it's great. I love to get mm. out there. The only thing that was bad was when my kids were young, um, I would go away and it was like, that was a little hard sometimes, you know, being away that long, but I tried to do it. So I wasn't away ever that, that long, but there were mm -hmm. times you know, might be gone three weeks or a month even, but for the most part, I got in for a while. I had the greatest thing in the world. I was doing a lot of corporate shows mm -hmm. and as you know, the corporate shows, you fly in one day, you fly yeah. home the next day. And right. I was doing, in, and before COVID hit, I was doing a bunch of those and those are great. The kids barely even knew I was gone when they were mm -hmm. literally, I, I take a red eye out to Michigan, right. land, you know, get there at 6 a.m., sleep during the day, do the show that night, get an early flight out in the morning, pick up three hours. I'm home before they're even up. And they were like, were you gone? And mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, I went and did a show, you know. That's ideal for a performer who has a family because otherwise, as yeah. you say, being on the road for a long time, it's very difficult to, when you have kids and you want to be in your kids' lives, you know. But I had it pretty good, you know, that I didn't stay out that that long. I would got these corporate shows done. They were great. I was going back and forth a lot. So it worked out pretty good. It really did. And um, now that they're older, they don't really care. They're like, where are you going? <laughs> you know. Yeah, it's and it's, it's nice, too. Now my wife will travel with me sometimes, too, which is kind of fun. Because when they were little, you know, she couldn't go anywhere. So now yeah. she's like. She's going. So she goes, I'm going to all these shows. I said, come on, let's go. So it's yeah. kind of fun. Let's Except go. I would sit in the hotel room, you know, until 10 minutes before showtime. And she would be out exploring every little thing, you know, two minutes before showtime. I go, I really got to get back now. I really should be there soon. You know, so <laughs> so it's more fun, though, for sure. At this point in your career, your life and career, what would you most like to do? Are you just happy continuing with the uh, kind of combination of venues and things that you do or is there one particular thing like a magic wand thing that you would most like to do like have your own tv show or a uh, movie or a uh, grand theater where you you are the uh that's your theater kind of thing or i don't know yeah anything yeah no no it's good that's good i think that um you know everybody would probably say your own tv show i guess would be great you know it would be fantastic and there was some stuff in the works we had not too long ago and it's still kind of going on where i have i was doing this thing called you know andy gross are you kidding me and it was, it looked at a little bit and still could be in the works for something. So who, who knows? But I mean, I am pretty happy with my career right now. I really got to say, because one of the things that's helped me is the internet has helped me so much because I can go now to shows and people will come out because they know me from the internet. Like the old days, you know, you had to, you had to have your own TV show or maybe be on, on the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson um, in order to get people to come see you. But now it's incredible. I'll, I'll go to a show and, you know, I'll get four or 500 people coming out because they know these videos. So just me doing these videos yeah. has helped so much. It's it's crazy. The so, internet changed everything, right? For everybody. 100%. 100%. I can't I can't uh, thank it enough because it really, I think it made what I do today. I mean, like I said, I'll go to small towns or big towns back anywhere and I'll always get my three to 500 people coming out. So it's nice. Well, what's coming up for you? Anything in particular that you'd like to mention for those people who see this interview shortly because people might be watching it years from now but you know coming yeah, up yeah, right yeah. now it's uh we're toward the end of june uh, 2023 so uh, what, well i that's right <laughs> 100 years i'm uh, doing a lot of shows coming up so if they go to the website which is just andy gross live.com not dead andy gross live.com <laughs> And, uh, and you don't have to spell out the whole thing. You, they don't have to say live, not dead, right? Or, or is that oh, no, right? no, they don't have to say that. It's just live. So Andy <laughs> Gross Live. 
dot com. Right. Leave out the not dead part, right? No, not the dead part. (laughs) Just so they remember live. Andy goes live dot com. But it's got all the tour dates on there and they can find them pretty easily. And um, come on out and have a good time is what I always tell people. That's that's what I like. I because I I love to go to small to mid-sized towns where they have these old theaters. You probably like this too, I'm sure. Mm. These old theaters that they're about to tear down. And all of a sudden the city or some wealthy businessman comes in and they restore this thing and it looks like you know beautiful theaters and then the whole town comes out to support these shows and these are neat i was just at one two weeks ago where houdini performed at you mm. know they had pictures they had pictures of houdini actually at the theater which i'm sure those pictures are pretty rare um where he used a trap door and they had the key that he used for it it was really neat and there was another one i was at that had all the old posters from the touring shows yeah. they used to put them in the back behind the stage and you could still see little pieces of them. And there was, you could see the H-O-U on the Houdini was still there. Pretty neat. So everybody out there, take your uh, opportunity to see Andy someplace near you. Check out uh, his website, andygrosslive.com. Is that it? That's it. That's it. Okay, so that's it. I'm going to put the link under this video. Okay. So look in yeah, the description, yeah. everybody. You can just click on it. But I figured verbally it's good to just mention it to everybody. Yeah. But but check. The, the link will be right here. That's the main link. But also follow Andy on all his social media, on uh, you know, TikTok and Instagram, TikTok, and probably on all of it, Instagram, right? TikTok, and you, Instagram, YouTube. Subscribe to his YouTube. I'll put all those links down here. Okay, sure. So you just uh, conveniently go to everything. But the main thing is that website. You probably have all the links from the website as well. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah there is. Great. So, Andy, it's been great to catch up with you again after all these years and to have you here as my guest. Yeah, well, thank you. I know I, I see your stuff out there quite a bit, too. So that's great, too, to see. Yeah, it's nice. Well, yeah, thank you. So all of you out there watching this, if you enjoyed this interview, and why would you not? Make sure to subscribe to this channel right now if you haven't done so and hit that notification bell so you won't miss future uploads. I'll be having a lot of other fascinating guests soon on this video podcast, Talking It Out. And right here on this channel, this is my main channel, Trillo and Suede, is where you can see the multi-award winning short film Casa Noir, which is just out now on YouTube for free. For a year or more, it was just in film festivals where it won 27 awards at last count at all kinds of international film festivals. But now it's for you to see for free for a limited time. So make sure to, to watch it if you haven't, as well as the Trill and Suede web series, which is also free right here on the web uh, on the uh, YouTube channel. So two seasons of it, of Trill and Suede web series. Also many other, hundreds of other videos of all sorts. Again, Andy, it was great catching up and having you here. Thank you for joining me. Yeah, thank you. It's great seeing you. And to all of you out there, see you soon.